You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everybody. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. And before I get started, I just want to remind you that there is a website called wealthformula.com which houses this podcast known as Wealth Formula Podcast. And there are all sorts of really interesting downloads and things to get involved with, lots of education. Also the place where you might consider joining Investor Club if you are an accredited investor. By the way, Investor Club has got lots of stuff going on either this month. And uh, I think that if you have not done so, you may wish to get off the sidelines Make your initial contact with Investor Club by going and simply clicking, and then you'll have a survey to fill out, then you and I will have a conversation, and then we can potentially get you involved in some of the things that are going on in this space. Again, go to wealthformula.com and check that out. Also, there is an opportunity to get involved just purely in the community, in the private Wealth Formula community. If you go to Wealth Formula Roadmap, you can check that out but it is basically a course and a, a private Facebook community, bi-weekly phone calls. You know, it's a very engaged group of individuals who are frankly kind of addicted to this stuff. So again, go ahead and check that out at wealthformularoadmap.com. We'd love to have you on board if you are the type of person who likes to geek out on personal finance, Wealth Formula style. Now, as I've said before, I am a lousy trader. I've said it before, I fully recognize it. And that's why I try very hard to stay focused on the idea of investing rather than trading. And, but nevertheless, I think for, you know, people like me who are kind of, you know, interested in, in speculating a little bit, it's not the worst thing in the world, uh, worst habit in the world if you recognize you've got it. I still get trapped in some of those behaviors and invariably I regret it. Usually it's not you know, life changing kind of stuff, but I sometimes forget it. Let me give you an example. Some of you know that I am an advocate of this thing known as Bitcoin. And I believe this is going to be one of the best investments of my lifetime. I really think that's going to happen. So when it dropped to like $3,100 per Bitcoin, I should have bought some more. You know, if I really have that conviction, I should have said, hey, this is a great price, right? You may not see, you may not see this ever again. Buy some but I didn't. Why? Because I got a little greedy. I figured, well, listen, it might drop some more. And if it drops some more, I could buy even more of it. Now, the end result of that entire exercise was that by the time I actually got in and bought more, it had actually doubled in price. Now, over the long run, I still think it it's not a bad price at all uh, to even at six, 7,000 or, or even 8,000, especially considering that Bitcoin $100,000, uh, I believe was something that will happen within the next couple of years. By the way, there was a really interesting interview, or I guess it was a debate on Tone Vase's YouTube channel, which you might want to check out. Tone Vase has been on the show a couple of times, but it was between him and Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff and a guy known as Saifedean uh, Amos, who wrote a book called The Bitcoin Standard, which is really uh, pretty amazing stuff. But it was so entertaining. I, I think you ought to check that out. But again, let's just getting back to my point here, I thought there was something of value here and rather than just buying something that had significant value, I decided I would try to get greedy and squeeze it down even more if I could, and then I lost. So in the heat of the moment like that, right, it's sometimes it's hard to remember Warren Buffett's wisdom. Now, Warren Buffett, who, by the way, hates Bitcoin, but he has a very smart guy, and here's a quote that I think is important to remember. He says, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price, right? The point is recognize when you have a good opportunity and can buy a quality asset at a fair price. And for heaven's sake, if you want to do it, just do it. Don't hesitate and try to, you know, see if you can get it even cheaper. Otherwise, it's going to pass you by. Now, some of you may disagree with me that Bitcoin is a quality asset and we can, disagree, you know, we can agree to disagree on that. And I think there's very some, if you watch the debate between Saifedean and Peter Schiff, for example, you will see that there's some smart peop people out there, 
who even have the same fundamental principles on the economy who can disagree on this point. But I'm on Safedine's side there. However, let's focus on the principle again, not with regard to Bitcoin, but just in general. You know, one of my friends who lives nearby me is uh, actually, he's a good guy. He's, he's also a famous home designer, not an architect, but he designs the homes and then he hires an architect to kind of make it happen. And he has designed some very famous homes in the U.S. He's particularly well known amongst Hollywood celebrities. And uh, anyway, really good guy. I've learned a lot from him too. He's a smart guy. He told me about a house once he had on uh, that he that he did and he put on sale in Los Angeles. And at the time, I think he said this was maybe a, a decade ago or something. It was the most expensive house for square foot in Los Angeles. And he had a very motivated buyer who happened to be the daughter of a well-known tech billionaire. And so my friend said that the dad, who was the billionaire, had three questions before he bought the house. The broker shared with him. The first question was, was the house in a desirable area? The second one, did the house have great views? And third, was the house built well? I mean, was the materials and the, you know, the construction all that good? So the broker assures him that all three answers were a resounding yes. And the billionaire went on and bought that house for his daughter at full price, knowing that it was the highest price per square foot in the area, per square foot. And the kicker here is that this, I think, happened just before the housing meltdown. But then 10 years later, he sold that house. The daughter moved out, sold the house at a significant profit. So most of the time when we think we are saving money, we really aren't, okay? That's, that's one of the things that I, that I have sort of discovered is sort of a moral of the story. It may be more expensive uh, to buy a higher quality asset or an asset that is in a higher quality area, for example, than it is to buy something in a lousy area or that's, a, you know, kind of a poor quality asset. However, over the long run, if you buy the quality asset in a quality area, et cetera, you're probably going to come out ahead. Think of it this way, right? Now, I hate to I hate to say this because, you know, I, I, I like IKEA. I, I used it when I was a young, uh, poor guy all the time. But IKEA furniture is not going to appreciate. That is the reality. IKEA furniture is never going to become something that has resale value that is greater than it was actually purchased for. So if you can afford it, if you're in that, you know, space where you can afford something nice, buy something that so that someday you have something that is a potentially greater value than it is today. I mean, that's the kind of perspective you get over time, which my friend has been sharing with me. He's also the guy who buys really, you know, vintage sports cars because he loves them and they always go up in value as opposed to buying a brand new car that loses value as you just drive it off the lot. Anyway, it's perspective that you get over time, right? And that's why it's a good idea to listen to people who've been around for a while. And now, Tyler Jenks, who's been on this show before, is one of, the go one of those guys. He's been in the financial industry since 1971. I mean, that's before, that's a long time. That's even before I was born. And, uh, you know, I'm no spring chicken. Now, Tyler can speak on a broad base of financial topics with perspective that is unusual and multidimensional. And I think that multidimensional is the key here. From the S&P 500 to gold and even to Bitcoin, Tyler is a wealth of knowledge and he's been on this show before and we talk primarily about Bitcoin. This time we're going to talk about the economy in general and how some of these asset classes fit into there. I really enjoyed this conversation. I always learn something with Tyler. So when we come back, Tyler Jenks. Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, my guest on Wealth Formula Podcast is Tyler Jenks. Tyler, as you may recall, was on a few months ago on uh, Wealth Formula Podcast and Consensus Network. And um, Bitcoin at that time was lingering. You know, it was lingering right around 6,000, 6,200 bucks, maybe 64. But it was really, really stable for months. And in fact, some people were joking around that it was actually more stable than Amazon. Uh, a lot of the major players in the market, like Mike Novogratz and 
um, you know, some of these other hedge fund guys were talking about how, you know, this was the bottom. And admittedly, I kind of had drank the Kool-Aid. And then Tyler was on the show, and he told us that there was going to be a big correction and that uh, he saw a significant uh, fall happening. And then literally within a couple weeks, I was on a Twitter feed watching Tyler as he almost in a Babe Ruth fashion uh, pointed out a, a it was coming the, like very quickly. And this was after the whole Bitcoin cash debacle. And the next thing you know, we fell down uh, to down to 3,100. Now, this was a big surprise to most people, wasn't to Tyler. Um, and as you may recall, he's been in traditional finance and markets since 1971. Um, with a distinguished career as a portfolio manager and chief investment officer during that period of time. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he's seen a lot of stuff. He's managed hundreds of millions of dollars for institutions, charities, pension funds, high net worth individuals, and he's currently president and chief investment officer of Lucid Investment Strategies. Tyler, uh, it's great to have you back on the show again. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, the first time around. Great questions and great conversation. Covered a lot of material in a fairly short period of time, but you're exactly right. Uh, the timing of this couldn't be more important. Uh, not just talking Bitcoin, but everything. What in the world is going on? Stock markets and currencies and the price of gold and politics. It, it's unbelievable. This is one of the most exciting times uh, in world history, in my opinion. Well, so, you know, I, I was going to focus on um, Bitcoin, but now that you bring up, you know, you talk about, you know, your background, you Bitcoin is, uh, you've been doing this since 1971. Bitcoin's only been around for a decade. Um, let's back up a little bit and talk about the markets at large and what's going on and what your view on that is. Because as you, as you just pointed out, you know, we've got, uh, I think look like it was, we were back to a bull market, but then now you've got the Chinese tariffs, 25% tariffs, et cetera. What is going on, Tyler? <laughs> what do you expect to have happen here? Well, I sure wish I knew. And, uh, you know, you've got to be humble at times like this. There's no one in the world that knows, not, uh, Powell, the head of the central bank in the U.S., the Federal Reserve, not Mario Draghi, no politician. Everybody's got their own sense of things, but uh, we know a couple of things that are factual. And uh, to me, it's those couple of things that are factual that we need to all consider. And Bitcoin plays a big part of this. And those two things are over the last 20 years, what has happened to world wealth compared to what has happened to world debt? Just a very simple concept. If you got, you know, $100,000 is your total wealth in the world, and you owe $150,000, there's trouble ahead. Well, that the same is true with a municipality or a corporation or a union pension fund but particularly true with a country. You can get away with it for a period of time, but the reason I said this is one of the most exciting times in world history is because the problem of world debt compared to world wealth. Now, in the last 20 years, right up through today, the total amount of wealth in the world has grown by approximately 137%, which sounds really good. And actually it is pretty good. The problem is that over the same time period, the total amount of debt in the world has grown by almost three times that much, over 300%, 330 some odd percent. And what that means is that in a very short period of time, and we're talking weeks and months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, for the first time in world history, the total amount of debt will be greater than the total amount of wealth. And that simply means that it, this problem must be solved. And so 
all of the things that I just talked about, stock markets and currencies and Bitcoin and gold, play into all of this confusion by people that know what the problem is, they just don't know what the solution is. Right. Well, let's talk about this in perspective of some of the things that I've heard you say recently, and recently meaning in the last month or two. Um, one thing I saw was that you became uh, completely bullish on the S&P 500, right? Now, yes. how do you reconcile becoming completely bullish on the S&P 500 and the markets with this idea of you know, significant uh, debt issues. How do, you, how do you reconcile that? Because are we looking at two time frames? What are we, because obviously there's this whole world out here, which particularly in real estate, real asset land, we have a lot of people who are always waiting for the, you know, waiting for the sky to fall. We hear that all the time. But to hear that in the context of also saying we're in a bull market, where, where does that leave an investor? Uh, very probably completely confused <laughs> and, for, and for very good reason. Right. Um, one of the five solutions to the debt problem that I outlined in an article in Medium called The Long and Winding Road to $10 million Bitcoin, I outlined five theoretical solutions to the debt problem. One of them which I believe is one of the least likely is growing out of the debt problem by having world GDP growing faster than interest rates and inflation. By definition, what that would mean is you're growing faster than the interest rates. Therefore you can pull away from them and slowly eat into the debt. Um, unfortunately, no country in the world is doing that except the United States. And the United States has only been doing it for a very short period of time. And this is not a political statement, but it started about the time that Donald Trump was elected. That might sound political, but it's not because it's purely an economical observation on my part that by cutting taxes, by ignoring trade agreements and alliance agreements, and redoing trade agreements with China and Mexico and Korea, trying to redo it with China, trying to back out of world groupings that cost a lot of money, uh, even though many people or most people believe in them, is a way of uh, a country, and it doesn't have to be the United States, any country pulling back and getting its own house in order. And to the extent that we've only got two and a half years of a record of that, we find that the strongest currency in the world as of this afternoon is the US dollar and has been for the last number of years. The strongest stock market in the world for the last 11 years has been the US stock market. The uh, fastest reduction of employ unemployment in the world has been in the United States. The greatest productivity growth of any country has been in the United States. And I can go on and on and on. Now, if, that, if this was Venezuela or this was Turkey or even France or Great Britain, it would not be a solution to the world problem. But we're talking about the largest economy in the world with the largest stock market in the world with the highest productivity in the world, which means maybe, but not probably, but maybe the US can help pull other countries up to the extent that they can get their GDP growth even slightly above inflation rates and their interest rates. And if that can occur, then maybe we buy ourselves another year or two years or three years or four years or five years before this debt problem comes home to roost. So the debt problem itself, when you when you talk about it coming home to roost, what is what exactly in your view does that look like? Well, what it means is if 
uh, you can't pay off your debts and you can't make payments on your interest, you have to beg for some sort of reduction in your interest rate on a credit card. You've got to renegotiate a mortgage or you've got to increase your income by getting a second job. If you don't do those things, people get upset because the opposite of the debt side or the counterparty is owed money. You owe money to someone or some institution or some country. And there's wiggle room, but there's not wiggle room for very long. You've got to solve that problem. The same is true for a corporation that gets deep into debt or a municipality, and we've got plenty of them, or a pension fund, or a country. If the whole world is in that situation, then what happens is you get 2006, 7, 8, and 9, where when one party, in this case, someone with a lot of junk bond mortgages, couldn't make payments to a counterparty, i.e. Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, AIG, Merrill Lynch. And when one domino went, somebody wasn't getting paid. And because that someone wasn't getting paid, they couldn't make payments to the next somebody and the entire house of cards collapsed. And then it spread worldwide and we came this close to having to face the debt problem 11 years ago. This time around, the central banks that pulled us out of that last one don't have the ammunition to do it. It's all been spent. And that's not theoretical. That's because prior to 2006, interest rates in the United States were 10%, excuse me, 6%. And today they're at 2.38% on the 10-year U.S. Treasury. Why does that matter? It matters because to stimulate an economy, a central bank or the treasury or the minister of finance needs to lower interest rates to be able to um, get people to borrow more and to make it more profitable for um, certain types of institutions it's called net interest margin, the difference between what a bank can borrow from a central bank and what they can lend out to you and me. Okay, when you've got 6%, you can cut it to five, and then five to four, four to three, three to two. We're now at, we're at two, and we were at zero. At zero, you can't cut anymore, we thought. Now we know that's not true, because 22% of all the currency in the world is from a country that has negative interest rates, right. below zero, right. which means if you put your money in the bank, in Japan, in the UK, in Germany, you have to pay them interest to keep it. They don't pay you interest. It's a negative interest rate. Therefore, the central bank can't cut it. They can't lower it anymore. And now we've got the problem that has been growing at 300%. 10 years later, a much, much worse problem than we had in 06, 07, 08 with no ammunition left. So one of the alternatives so critical. in that situation might be to let inflation climb, right? And so that you can effectively decrease the amount of nominal debt by essentially making it worth less. Right? Is isn't that isn't that one of the options that countries like the U.S. are looking at, and why they target having a certain level of, of inflation every year? Yes, but that target is about two percent, and they can't achieve it. They've been trying for eleven years to get up to a two percent inflation rate, and they haven't been able to do it. We're at about one point seven percent right now. And that's true worldwide. We're not talking about an inflation problem. We are talking about an inflation problem in Zimbabwe, in Argentina, in Venezuela, and in Turkey. Uh, but those are localized problems where you can create, print more money and more money and more money and more money, which is what inflation basically is. And with that money, 
people think, well, I've got more money now, I can buy more things. But what's really happening is the money is getting more and more worthless relative to those things, the, the goods you, you, you want to have, including, uh, including money, including money. Um, and what I mean by that is we went through an 80-year period that started in the early 1940s of interest rates and inflation increasing and an increase and increasing for 40 years. And that got us into the 1970s where Nixon closed the gold window, which was Bretton Woods in 1944 had set up to say that every currency in the world can be converted into either the US dollar or into gold. And by doing that, the US dollar and gold and every other currency, including Zimbabwe or Argentina or Venezuela, uh, was pegged to those things going up and down. The problem is the U.S. started running deficits, which is what you're talking about, inflating back in 1960. And so from 60 to 71, under Kennedy and then under Johnson, what happened is we were running big deficits for the first time in U.S. history. And when you run a deficit, your currency goes the other way because you're printing more money. That's what a deficit is, is you ran a deficit, so you make it up by printing some money. Now, um, Nixon realized that this was not going to last very long. So he shut down Bretton Woods, closed the ability for people to convert their currencies into gold or the dollars. And that ended what we know as the gold reserve currency of Bretton Woods. And ever since then, everybody can print as much as they want. And some do, and they get into deep trouble and then everything collapses. But the big uh, developed countries don't, or they try not to, uh, except over a very long period of time, which is why those figures I gave you are so important. So um, I'm not trying to be a historian, but it's important to understand that the only way to stop what you are now suggesting was done by Paul Volcker in 1979 when he became the Federal Reserve Chairman in the United States. At that time, you and I could go to a bank, put our money in it and get paid 20% interest on money market funds. And you could buy a US Treasury bond and get paid 15.5% interest on it. Why? Because inflation was 21% from in the 70s and that's why the price of oil went up the price of gold went up the price of silver sugar all commodities went up and the value of the dollar can kept decreasing and decreasing so what he did is he said one man did this i mean yeah he had an open market committee and there's other people sitting around the table but basically one man did this he said i'm going to kill inflation in the united states once and for all so he jacked interest rates higher and higher and higher and higher and put us into two very deep recessions in 1980 and 1982. And lo and behold, he killed inflation. And from that date, remember that was 40 years of interest rates and inflation going up. From that date, we've had 40 years of interest rates and inflation going down right up to today. And that's why it's so Im almost impossible to get inflation and in interest rates up. We are in a deflationary world now, not an inflationary one. So how do you put that in getting back to the initial concept of how do you put the, the issues that you're talking about, a deflationary world with all of the debt that we have? How do you put that in context with being bullish on the S&P 500 right now? Because as long as the US economy remains strong relative to other countries. Money flows from those countries into our, our, not only economy, but our stock market. As long as our stock market continues its 11 and a half year bull market, the longest in the US history, which is true right up through today, as long as we can go another day, another week, another month, another year, 
that puts the problem off. I am ready at the drop of a hat to get out of this market. But the signals are not there as of this afternoon. They were there on two different occasions last year. Now, what happened in 2018 was that in 2017, the stock market was up 21%, hitting new highs. In 2018, we hit a high and then we dropped 10%. Then we went up in September and hit another high and we dropped 20% into December of last year. Since then, we've gone all the way back up to a new high just three weeks ago. So during that period of time, that 2018, I got 25% out of the stock market as it was going down. Then I put the money back in as it was going up. Then I got 100% out of the stock market going into December and it stopped going down and I put 50% back into the stock market. When I say I put in, what I'm talking about is I manage money for a, a number of people and I consult to a number of people. We made those decisions for their accounts. Now, since then, I was only 50% in the stock market up until April the 1st of this year. April the 1st of this year, I got signals again. When I say signals, I use technical tools that I've built myself and a lot of other people have built that I use their systems. And on April the 1st, I went 100% back into the stock market. Now, since then, we did go to new highs. But over the last two weeks, we've begun to slip again. So what I'm telling you is I'm not dogmatic. I'm very practical that the problem is so big and the result of that problem coming home to roost and I'll, I'll tell you briefly what I mean by that, is it's going to be worse than 06, 07, 08, and 09 in terms of banks, real estate, stock markets on a worldwide basis, much worse. Therefore, I'm not I holding a couple of sticks of dynamite. Somebody's lit both of them, and I'm watching very carefully as the wick gets smaller and smaller, but I'm still holding that, that, that dynamite. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of what you just mentioned there, I mean, we're, we're big in this program, not necessarily so much in the equity markets, but real estate and, and these sort of things. Certainly a bull market continues there as well. The question, I guess, from my perspective is that what do you see? You've effectively said the reason that we keep rising is that the U.S. economy is the least ugly economy in the world, right? I mean, that's the idea is that, okay, things aren't good, but compared to other places, we're, we're doing much better. We have a better economy. We're a stronger, uh, stronger economy in general, and so we've got flight coming in. What do you see that could change that, and what kind of time horizon do you expect? I mean, is it something in the next year? Could it be something that continues for another five or even 10 years? Or how do you see this? How do you gauge that? Because it seems like a, you know, one of these things that it's not like it's this problem started yesterday. What makes it imminent to go off? Well, what is the trigger point for the, the wick burning down till it's actually enough to explode? And the answer to that is in a macroeconomic sense, what we don't want to happen is what happened in 07 and 08, which is an accident somewhere that starts the ball rolling down the hill. Some people call it a black swan event or a long tail event on a bell curve. Something unexpected happens. Somebody goes to war with somebody else. Some bank fails. Some brokerage firm fails. And that starts a chain reaction. There's no way to predict when and how that would occur. So the second possibility is that the powers that be, meaning not the policymakers, but the central bankers of the world, the IMF and the World Bank, 
that know everything that I have said in great detail, but don't talk about it publicly all the time because you don't want to cause a panic, which then is a black tail event in itself. I and many, many other people that know what is going on from an economic point of view understands how delicate their situation is. But that doesn't mean that they haven't been spending years coming up with solutions. None of those solutions are going to be good. The only one that is, is the one I just talked about, growing out of the problem, which is the least likely. And they all know that that's not going to occur, so they want to put it off as long as possible. The reason I believe that our central bank, our Federal Reserve, backed off under pressure by Trump, it wasn't Trump that did that. They know what was going on. They know we can't let the U.S. slip into a recession. And it was becoming evident by their raising interest rates over and over and over again over the last three years, where we've gone from zero to the 10-year going up to 3.30%, that it was beginning to take hold and slow down the economy. Trump was saying it in public, but they knew it because they know all the numbers and they backed off in December of last year. That was the bottom of the stock market. It wasn't coincident. They said, okay, okay, okay. We aren't going to raise any time in 2019, we promise you. And we might not do it in 2020. And now they said, maybe our next move is gonna to be to cut interest rates. So let's just stipulate that there's a lot of smart people pulling a lot of levers that know the problem we're talking about. So if they know that's the problem and they know they can no longer make the payments that are needed to counterparties worldwide, one of the other four solutions I have has to be done. One of them, which is the worst, but I think the most probable without an accident occurring is for the governments to get together and default on the debt. It's happened a couple of times with horrible consequences. Russia did it with the ruble. Argentina did it at one point with the peso. And every other country in the world jumped all over them and wouldn't do business with them until they cleaned up their act and, and they paid off their sovereign debt. In both cases, that happened. Venezuela is right on the border of doing that. They've been having to sell gold illegally in order to pay, pay their debts. That's not what we're talking about. It's not a localized problem. It's a worldwide problem and all the big players worldwide know it. So they all get together. Here is a solution. Horrible for everybody, but it solves the problem. And you say all banks are closed worldwide starting at Friday night at five o'clock UTC time and reopening on Monday morning. And on Monday morning, all debt the debt you owe on your mortgage, the debt you owe on your credit card, the debt you uh, thought was credit because you bought a U.S. Treasury bond and you gave the U.S. government, loaned the U.S. government $50,000 and got a Treasury bond. That is, you are the creditor, the U.S. government is the debtor. The $100,000 you thought you had on Monday morning is $50,000. That's all they will pay you. And that's worldwide, and that solves the debt problem. Now, what are the consequences of that? And you're saying this is the most, you think this is the most likely. Yes, that's the most likely because every day that goes by, the problem is worse. And every day that goes by and they haven't done that, or they haven't done number one or number two, which is going to Bitcoin, which there is the least likely other than growing out of the problem today. It won't be in the future. But the world is not ready for Bitcoin as a world standard today. It, the other thing they can do and they should do and they need to do before it's too late is to go back to a gold standard. And they could do it the same way I just described solving the debt problem by defaulting on the debt by saying, okay, nobody can buy or sell gold uh, over the next 72 hours, all exchanges are closed, uh, all bullion dealers are closed, all futures markets are closed, all option markets are closed. 
yeah, you can sneak around and, and buy a gold coin from your neighbor. Just don't let us see you do it. And then we have closed all the gold markets. We have another Bretton Woods that only takes hours instead of the 22 days it took back in 1944 because of everybody can talk to everybody instantaneously over the internet. They say Monday morning, we are going to peg gold at $20,000 an ounce. That solves the debt problem. Why? Because they just created out of thin air an enormous amount of wealth. Today, there's only seven and a half trillion dollars in all the gold in the world. All of the gold, your, the gold in, on your ring finger, the gold in your teeth, gold you've got in your safety deposit box, and all the gold by all the central banks in the world, plus all the jewelry and everything else, seven and a half trillion dollars. Well, I said that the total amount of debt is running up very close to $300 trillion. But if you all of a sudden make all that gold worth many, many, many times more than it's worth right now, that means that central banks that have gold have now got the reserves necessary to pay off their debt. What are the consequences? If you own gold, you, you've made it. If you don't own gold, everybody else that owns it has made it. You have, I don't mean just individually or corporations or hedge funds or mutual funds, but countries, who right. owns the most gold in the world? Right. The U.S. The U.S. And actually, we are seeing a fair amount of activity in terms of, you know, Russia and China buying up a lot of gold. Do you think that that's an in, sort of an anticipation of something like this type of event? Absolutely. You're exactly right. Over the last seven years, the three biggest buyers of gold in the world have been China, India, and Russia. And even with that, the US owns more gold this afternoon than the three biggest countries in the world that own gold. And they don't happen to be China, Russia, and India. France is right up there at the top. Italy, believe it or not, is right up there at the top. So you can divide everybody up by who's got the gold today and the question is, the powers that be, the central bankers and the finance ministers of their countries, uh, if they see what Russia, China, and India are doing, and they know where the U.S. is, you should be seeing an enormous increase in the dollar value of gold. And you're not. It's right. not going up. So explain to me why that is, because this, admittedly, Tyler, the last, and my listeners know this, they're probably chuckling right now, but I have been very critical in general of owning gold, just because, for a variety of reasons, but namely that is some of the things that people talk about as the virtues of owning gold, the fact that it is a real asset. I, my argument to that is, well, real estate's a real asset too. And if inflation is a hedge to inflation, well, real estate is also a hedge to inflation. So help me understand what the, is your recommendation at this point, or not recommendation, but are you suggesting that people own a certain percentage potentially of gold just to hedge this potential catastrophe? I mean, how likely do you think, in your view, is it that we go back to a gold standard? I've been looking at this as really something of a an unlikely scenario. I think it's a very unlikely scenario if all they do is go to a gold standard and peg all the currencies against that gold at some, some price. Let's call it $1,000, which is $274 less than it is right now. But it's a nice round number, and uh, it's carried on the books in the United States at $35 an ounce still. Uh, we don't carry it at market value in Fort Knox or at the Federal Reserve in New York. It's carried at the old, at the old rate. So $1,000 would be a tremendous increase if, that, if all currencies were pegged at that. But it wouldn't do anything to the debt problem. wouldn't do a thing to the debt problem. You need to increase the total world 
wealth overnight. And the only way you can do that is by taking money out of certain things and putting it into something else that increases tremendously in size. And, and what would that be? What it would be is wealth in the form of stocks, mutual funds, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, central banks, buying that thing, let's call it Bitcoin in this case, which is what gets Bitcoin up to five or $10 million per Bitcoin, because those players need to take something that is only worth a small amount, $200 billion today in Bitcoin and other cryptos, or seven and a half trillion dollars in gold and make that go much, much bigger. But you, you don't do that on credit. You've got to take something from something. Right. In other words, from stocks, from corporations, from cash, from bonds, and put it into that thing to make it grow very quickly. And they could do that with gold. They cannot do that with Bitcoin because they cannot regulate Bitcoin. They can't say tomorrow morning, Bitcoin is going to be a million dollars per Bitcoin. Why? Because nobody can control the price of Bitcoin except you and me. If I sell it to you at a higher price uh, than it is trading right now and you're willing to buy it, the price goes up. They can do it if they are the purchasers. Now, they are not ready to be the purchasers in Bitcoin or any other crypto because every other week, some new fraud comes along that shows how porous the infrastructure of the crypto market is. And that's why we had the bear market that took us from $20,000 down to $3,000. Not because of the intrinsic worth of what Bitcoin is and can be, just because there's no way for me to get it to you safely through an exchange or even through a wallet without being hacked. That's changing, but we need time to change it with lightning and Tor and Schnorr and the satellite that has been put up. And all, all of the things that are being developed will take care of that problem technically and logistically, but we ain't nowhere close to that at this point. Gold is, gold is ready to go. It's been done before, over and over again, centuries. It's sitting there now. China, India, and Russia know it. Their smart people know that it is one of the possible solutions to this problem. They're getting ahead of it. The U.S. has already done that by holding as much gold as we have. So that's why I say the most probable, if the governments have a choice and aren't forced into it by an accident or a domino starting to fall and they get ahead of the problem, I think gold is what they will end up doing. Mm -hmm. The other, the other uh, thing that I've heard people talk about is you know, injection into economies, central banks essentially tapped, as you, you said, with the interest rates and everything, but getting um, the special drawing rights involved. Have you heard of this theory with the SDR? Absolutely. And what's interesting about it, and, you know, I've talked to an awful lot of people that didn't put two and two together here, but the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank were created in 1944 at Bretton Woods. What happened at Bretton Woods is not only changing the entire world landscape in terms of reserve currencies, the U.S. dollar and gold, against every other currency. That's why oil is designated in dollars. And that's why almost every commodity around the world is designated in dollars and have been since 1944, is because it was set up that way. When Nixon closed the gold window in 1971 and broke that thing apart, he left two important things still there, the IMF and the World Bank, and they're still with us today. What you're talking about is called a special drawing right, or the SDR, which is basically worth one, guess what it is, dollar. Each SDR is one dollar. And that's what is used by the International Monetary Fund when they make a loan 
to Ghana or to Venezuela or to Malaysia. It's all through these special drawing rights. They say, okay, we're going to give you a billion dollars. What the country gets is a billion SDRs. So it's almost like a token. It's almost like a stable coin. It's almost like what JP Morgan just did coming up with the Chase coin, which is simply a stable coin that stays at a dollar. It's an easy way to move money around within a banking system. Well, the IMF and the World Bank have that. Now, here's what people don't realize. Since 1944, the head of the World Bank is always an American. The head of the IMF is always a European. Now, what people also don't realize is that out of all the 220 countries in the world, only one of them has veto power over what everyone else wants to do, and that's the United States. And it's written in the agreements all the way back in 1944, that anybody can have veto power with one condition. You have to have 15% of world GDP. Only one country does, the United States. And because of that, the U.S. is in a position, because the head of the World Bank is always an American. David Malpass was just nominated weeks ago from the United States. Again, why do I talk about the U.S. growing and the U.S. being the most powerful and the U.S. having to be the one that's got to pull everybody else? It's, it's ingrained within the world economic macro system. And it's the engine. It's not because I'm a patriot, which I am, waving a flag, which I do. It's because of the structure of how world economics works. And because of that, yes, there is what I've added as a fifth solution to the problem, which is overnight, over a weekend, all of a sudden, this instant wealth that could be created with Bitcoin or with gold can certainly be created with SDRs. And how do they do it? They simply say, remember when we said we were going to do a dollar per SDR, starting Monday morning, it's a thousand dollars. That takes care of the problem. Yeah. Well, and and I bring that up because in many regards, the SDR seems to me because of the ability to control that situation and potentially being less disruptive uh, than a gold standard or or some of the other alternatives, that the SDR might actually be the most likely scenario, but why wouldn't it be? Well, remember one country has veto power, only one. Right. So the question is, is the U.S. in a position historically, politically at this point in time to give up all sovereignty to the World Bank and the IMF, because that's what you would be doing. And beyond the US, what about every other country? There are a lot of people who for a very long time have gotten their hackles up about the fact that a global world government doesn't make sense. It's great in theory and it looks good on paper but the differences between the various cultures and the various political systems all being run, let's take the United Nations as an example, how well is that doing what it is supposed to be doing? Well, we can debate that, and there's people on both sides, but the United Nations has very little power over sovereign nations. The World Bank and the IMF have total control over central banks around the world that seem to be acting in concert more and more. So I don't know the answer, but you're right. It would be the simplest thing to do, and I think with the most horrible consequences of all the other possible solutions. Effectively creating world money at 
that point. Exactly. Okay, so let's go all the way back and circle back to Bitcoin because now we've got, you know, the whole scenario in front of us. We understand that, you know, markets may, you know, in your perspective, go, continue to go up just because we're the uh, least ugly economy in the, in the world. Um, but at some point, something may happen and trigger some event. And Bitcoin at that point comes into play. And is this the scenario, although extremely unlikely, uh, ad- admittedly at this point, where you talk about the, the case for a $10 million Bitcoin? Yeah, um, the reason I called it the long and winding road is it will be exactly that. I don't think it's going to be difficult in the next bull market, which might have started already. I don't believe it has, but a lot of people do that are very, very smart. They think since we broke through 6,000 from underneath and ran up to 8,400, and now we're messing around 7,800 to 8,000, that that could be the beginning of a new bull market. That is a possibility. I don't think it will be difficult if this is a new bull market for us just within our own little world, meaning the crypto world, and there aren't many of us, but there's enough of us, I think, to get the price up to $100,000 by ourselves without institutions, without banks, without hedge funds, without mutual funds, without ETFs, just us. Why do I say that? Because so many people that are interested didn't get in for the run from 1,000 up to 20,000. And those that did get in stayed in all the way down to 3,000. Not 100%, but believe me, the vast majority. I say that because I've talked to thousands of them through my blogs and through Twitter and we do webinars and stuff. And I always ask everybody I talk to on a one-to-one person, when were you interested? How did you hear about it? When did you first invest in it? When did you get out? And the answers are all the same. Well, we heard about it in 2015, didn't do anything. 2016, uh, it had been going down in 14 and 15. We were afraid. Finally, in 2017, we got in. And when we got in, oh my gosh, it changed our lives. And we could see our future going on forever, and we were crazy wealthy, and then we wrote it all the way back down. Now, luckily, some of them say, we wrote it back down until we heard you say, get the heck out, and some people did at 15,000, at 12,000, at 10,000, at 8,000. And then we started screaming, 6,000, it's not going to hold, it's going to break. It did, it broke from 6,000 down to 3,100. Now, a bunch of people are irritated because I was calling for 1,000, I'm still calling for a thousand and I'm doing that on a fundamental basis as, as well as a technical basis. The technical basis is a thing called hyperwave, which calls for a thousand on the fundamental side. We've already discussed it. The infrastructure is a mess. Uh, The regulators are getting closer and closer to shutting down a lot of things and sending a lot of people to jail and they need to do that. And once they do that, wherever the bottom is will be the bottom. Now, some very great analysts are saying 3,000 was as far as we needed to go and now we're going up. I, for the first time in 17 months, bought Bitcoin for myself and my clients and my family um, between 6,200 and 6,800. We didn't buy that on the way up, we bought it on the way down. We put orders in at 6,800, 6,600, 6,400, 6,200, when we were up at 8,200. We had the flash crash that went from 8,200 down to 6,200, and it filled all of our orders, so we are in. So I told everybody in our vlogs and on Twitter, uh, for the first time in 17 months, I have bought Bitcoin. Didn't touch it in between those periods. But very few people have done that. Some people that didn't get in the first time are now getting in, which is great because they're getting in at potentially very low prices, meaning anything less than $10,000 all the way down to $1,000 in my estimation personally is going to not be significant in the future. If you buy it at 1,000 or 3,000 or 7,000 or 10,000, it's not going to matter because it's going to go so high under the right conditions. 
Now, let's say that is where we are right now. We've started a bull market. What I think is going to happen is we're going to stall out somewhere between 8,500 and 10,000 right now and then retest, drop back down again for a bunch of reasons we don't have time to talk about. But if and when it can get above 10,100 and 11,100, I think it's got a very good chance of getting back to old highs at 20,000. We could be talking days or weeks. I'm not talking five years from now. I don't believe that's gonna happen, but it's a possibility. That's why I've told everybody I will never, ever, under any circumstance, short Bitcoin. I didn't short it when it was at 20,000, even though my signal said it's going all the way back to 1,000. Why? Because tomorrow morning it could be at 100,000. It's that, got that kind of potential. No other asset class in history has that kind of potential. You don't want to bet against it. That doesn't mean you have to be in it, but don't ever bet against it. Bet against all the other cryptocurrencies, if you want, short them all. They're all going to zero at some time. Bitcoin won't. Now, if we can get above 20,000, we will get to 50,000 very quickly because of all the people that wanted to get in that didn't. They say, finally, it's here. Right. And FOMO will take it as unbelievable prices. I think it stalls out around 100,000. 100,000 is very important to Bitcoin. That puts it at one quarter of the value of all the gold in the world. Right now, it's not even one tenth of 1%. But at 100,000, all of a sudden, it's one quarter of it. And at 400,000, it's equal to all of the gold in the world. And at that point, it becomes an obvious choice for everybody outside of the ecosystem, banks and corporations and hedge funds and family offices, uh, they don't want to be left behind if it is the asset that is killing all the other assets, which Bitcoin has done as of today, from its beginning point, no asset ever in history has appreciated to this extent over that short period, period of time. So the difference in between making a call on where we are and what the potential is, is night and day. And I just want to make that very, very clear. Um, but that, that's a, a, a great question because if and when it's time for it to go, it is not going to have a problem pulling in everybody from the outside. And then it, uh, it can take its rightful place, I think. You know, uh, I wonder, um, what if we hit $100,000 before, as you've talked, uh, you know, about some of the fundamental problems with Bitcoin before we're ready for prime time? Does that mean we go back to, you know, we, it's just another huge bull run followed by... I'm afraid, I'm afraid so. And I say that because that's, I don't want it to happen. It'd be fun and people know what they're doing. They can get out at the top. There's tools to allow you to do that. But then you've got years and years after the fact of it coming down and going lower and lower and going through this whole nightmare that so many people have gone through, but there'll be a whole lot more people involved in it. And that could keep it down for a long time. So I don't want that to happen. What I want to happen with Bitcoin is an S curve, not a bubble, not a hyperwave, but an S curve where it goes up and then the higher it goes up, it's adopted more and more and more until it gets to a point it doesn't have to go up anymore. And it's basically pegged at that point. I put it between five and $10 million. Um, it can be half of that, two and a half million to five million. If, and this is what I would hope to happen, I'm trying to finish an article on it right now, is that governments are smart enough to realize they can't control Bitcoin, they can control gold. And if they go to a gold standard, but everybody else in the world wants a Bitcoin standard, the Bitcoin being bought up by everybody else in the world will kill the gold standard. So here's a solution. Let's do a 50-50 split. Let's make all the currencies of the world reliant on two reserve currencies, not the US dollar and gold, but Bitcoin and gold. The governments would 
accept that because they've got gold or have access to it. And they would realize that if they also had it pegged to Bitcoin at, let's call it, two and a half million dollars, which they aren't going to force on us, but we will drive it up that high because it will be a valuable asset that everybody wants. And then peg all currencies of the world to that couplet, gold and Bitcoin, I think it works and it's acceptable and it solves the debt problem. At this point, just uh, just sort of wrap it up. When you call this the long and winding road, um, and and also specifically, you're you're not saying that this is uh, highly unlikely. In fact, you're saying this is pretty likely to happen, right? To to have multi million dollar Bitcoin. What's the time horizon you you would say? I mean, I know this could happen very quickly, but would you say that if you had to bet either ten years from now or not? Uh, do you think that this is a phenomena that happens within the next decade, or is this two decades, three decades? To me, it's dependent on the overlying problem. How long can we put that off? If we can put it off for 10 years, then I think Bitcoin can take those kind of uh, numbers in that period of time. If it occurs before that, if it, something blows up in the next couple of years, Bitcoin's not ready and it's not going to be part of the solution. So again, my argument about why growth is the best way to go, keep everybody keep your fingers crossed that this experiment that's going on in the U.S. continues to work long enough to help enough countries to get their act together and maybe adopt some of the same principles of lower taxes, not higher taxes. Uh, spurring business, so profitability increases, employment increases, all that sort of stuff, just basic economics, which nobody seems to grasp anymore, even though they've got a great example of it going on here. Um, so my guess would be that within the next 10 years, we will either have a gold standard, Bitcoin will have taken a place in that standard, or uh, if the gold standard comes very quickly, meaning the next 24 months, Bitcoin will drop below a thousand and stay there for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So I am not saying it's inevitable. I'm saying it is preferable. I want it to happen. I believe it's going to happen, but it's a long and winding road to get there. A lot of things have got to fall in place for Bitcoin to, to take that place. Tyler, tell us a little bit more about Lucid Investments, how we can follow you, and, you know, if you're, uh, about your consulting business. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. We've got a website called lucidinvestmentstrategies.com, all one word, believe it or not. Lucidinvestmentstrategies, plural, dot com, and it tells you about everything we do and uh, what webinars we have, what workshops we have, uh, and it's also linked to all of our uh, vlogs. We've done 150 of them and all of our Twitter feeds. It's all there. Um, and basically um, what we do is we consult one-on-one -on -one with individuals that have questions. Like all the questions we've had today, if a person has questions, they can go onto our website and uh, log on and set up a consultation and it's all explained right there. And the other part of what we do is we actually uh, manage money almost none in the crypto space, it's all traditional markets, but more and more uh, I will be putting in um, Bitcoin, probably through GBTC for a while, the Bitcoin Investment Trust, which is a security. It doesn't have to be moved around exchanges in the infrastructure. And maybe in two or three weeks, uh, Fidelity is coming out with a monster program which might be one of the reasons we look like we're in a bull market right now. I would take a long time to describe it, but I've worked with them for 35 years. It's a privately held corporation. It's got $7 trillion of assets. It is well-regulated and understands the regulators and the regulators understand them. 
They're going to open it up to institutions to be able to buy and sell Bitcoin, store Bitcoin, deep storage, cold storage, all right at Fidelity. Very exciting news. Fantastic. So, Tyler, again, I want to thank you so much for all your time today. It's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it was uh, both times. Uh, great questions. Thank you, Buck. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. This conversation with Tyler, you know, I, I just really t like talking to this guy. He's a really smart guy. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, too. You know, it's funny because I particularly like conversations where I feel like somebody has challenged what I'm, what I'm believing, what I'm thinking, the way I think, et cetera. As you know, and I know a lot of you are thinking, I know you're probably thinking, well, yeah, he's talking about gold. He's going to start bashing it again. Well, Tyler reminded me of probably the one thing that makes me have, you know, some redemption for gold in my mind, which is that, Okay, is the gold standard likely to happen? I don't think it is. Now, Peter Schiff, Peter Schiff thinks it's going to happen for sure. And I don't really, I think it's highly unlikely to happen, but it's still possible. And I think the biggest reason that leaves me thinking, well, it's still possible is the fact that China and Russia in particular are hoarding this stuff. Why else would you buy this? Why else would you, Right unless there was some potential preparation for some kind of global reset of the financial system using a gold standard. So again, I don't think it's likely now and, and I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does, you're right. Those, you know, the people who own gold will obviously benefit significantly. After all, you know, the only reason to do that, right, would be to set the gold standard back again is so that you know, governments could set the prices and then set it really high. And so that ultimately wipes out all of this central bank debt. So anyway, am I going to go out and buy some now? Well, I'm not rushing, but I've got it in the back of my head and maybe it makes sense to have a little bit. I don't know. I've got a lot of other things that rather get, but it, it may make sense as a little bit of an insurance policy based on some of the uh, geopolitical behavior. So again, I am open. I've, I've asked people to change my mind about things several times. Tyler didn't even know that I was kind of, that, that I was asking people to challenge my belief on gold, but I think he actually did there. Anyway, I have to say that I'm always happy when people make me change my mind. So it was again, a great conversation. Now, speaking of good conversations, I just want to remind you one more time, we'd love to have you as part of Wealth Formula Network. Wealth Formula Network is where the magic happens. It's our private community. Start off with a course, move it into a private, you know, Facebook community. We have our own portal. We have bi-weekly Zoom calls. We get to see each other. It's a really, really tight group. We have some really good conversations in there. So if you're the type who really wants to get more involved, who really likes talking about this stuff and whose neighbors never want to talk about it, whose wife or husband never wants to talk about this stuff, good place to join. Go to WealthFormulaRoadmap.com. Check it out. That's it for me this week. This is Buck Joffrey with Wealth Formula Podcast signing off. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.